wanted to uh, um, thank all of you who have um, wished your condolences uh, for our family. Um, as many of you may know or may not know, uh, my grandmother passed away this week, and uh, she's a lifelong member here at the church. And uh, today will be her viewing from uh, 2 to 4, and then uh, we'll have the funeral service tomorrow at 10. Uh, but uh, it was in um, thinking about this message and just thinking about um, her and my grandfather, the fact that they are united today is just a blessing to me. I think that they have uh, 72 years maybe of marriage that they've had together, and I just um, am so thankful that they get to be back together and one other arms. And so for me, it's more of a celebration. It's not uh, real somber for me because I'm just glad that they're where they have always intended to be with who they intended to be with. And so uh, this morning we're starting our new series, and um, it's on relationships and I'm, I'm not just looking at relationships as far as uh, marriage relationships, even though we are going to look at, at those each and every week. But we also just want to look at relationships that we have with friends, co-workers, family, and all of those as well. I was uh, doing a little bit of Google search this week, and as I was looking, it said that 75% of the closest relationships we have are actually through family, whether it be a spouse or a child or a parent. Uh, those are our closest relationships. And the others then either come from coworkers or friends. I just thought that was interesting. But as I look at relationships, um, uh, one of the, what we're trying to do is here, we're, we want to look at like four different types of relationships over the next several weeks. And each week we are going to, uh, and matter of fact, as we look at these four different avenues, they may be ones that you're in right now. They may be ones that you have been in, or they may be ones that you may be in in the future. But to help convey sort of each point every week, we're going to take a look at um, relation as it, as it uh, moves through us with ships or boats. We're going to try to have a visual image for each one of those that we're looking at. But the way I look at relationships, relationships can be great, they can be tricky, and, the, and at times it can be a little bit nasty. The, uh, the one we're going to focus on today as we look is we're going to focus on the idea of a sailboat. Now, again, I'm not, a, um, I'm not an authority on boats at all. I just want you to know that. So if I get something wrong along the way, you can let me know. I, uh, I, I do like cruise ships because there's a lot of fun on those. All right. But uh, the other stuff I'm actually a little bit more afraid of because I don't swim really well. And so uh, I would be afraid that I would go into the ocean and then drown, basically. So, so those make me a little bit, all the other stuff makes me a little bit more nervous. But as we're looking at sailboats, I don't want us to think about the sailboats in our day and age to where like they have all these advancements and they're easier to take care of today. I want us to think about sailboats, you know, back in the day. And even as I'm talking through this message, some of you may think that this more aligns with uh, what we call lifeboat. And again, not the powered ones that they have today, but more the ones that would just sort of be sitting on the ocean. You're just waiting for the waves to happen. Sailboats, on the other hand, we know need what to make them go? Sail. sail and wind, right? And in that wind and in that sail, what they're hoping to come across is that wind will push you and cause some sort of movement that you'll be able then to go across the ocean. Uh, what stinks then if you were ever in a place where they didn't have much wind or if you were on a lifeboat and you didn't have any oars or you didn't have a sail and you were just sitting there, you would have to be uh, you have to sort of succumb to the waves and when they would take you and where you would go with those. And I think if most of us would be honest, I think either at times or maybe even currently, we may be in relationships that may be, maybe feel that way, feel like there is no, sort of no forward motion. We just sort of go where the waves cause us to go or we hope for a wind to push us one way or the other. And in those times that we have sort of real struggle um, those are sort of the relationships that we, get in, that we get involved in. The passage of scripture we're going to be looking at today is in Genesis chapter 29. We're going to be starting with verse 15, and then we're going to move all the way through 35. But just like a sailboat needs the wind in order to keep it moving, I also believe that relationships need some sort of movement to keep it going. And so from time to time, if we don't have that excitement or we don't have those uh, forces that are causing us to have a better day, sometimes we can feel like we're not going anywhere. Before we start in this section of uh, scripture, I do have to go a little bit through the background of this story. So we're going to be going several chapters back and dealing with several other people in the Bible to get us to where we are at today. Now, for some of you, as soon as I go over this story, you're going to know right where we're going. You're going to know the people in the story. You're going to sort of know the history. Matter of fact, I'll end up, because I'll be naming so many names today, I'll end up messing up names along the way. And then you're, in your mind, you'll correct them. 
Others of you, you will recognize certain names and be like, oh, that's how they're connected with one another. And then those of you who are fairly new to the word of God and fairly new to church, you may not recognize any of these names. So that's what we're going to give you a little bit of the background story today. I want to start with Abraham. Abraham, for a lot of religious and for a lot of faith, is sort of known as the founder of, of a lot of the faith that we have out today. And Abraham was married uh, to Sarah and Abraham was considered a righteous man. Now, it doesn't mean he was perfect. It doesn't mean that he never had any trials or problems in his life. Because I promise you, even if I don't go through, because I'm not going to go through all of the little things today. But if you would go back and read this story, it is a perfect soap opera that you've ever seen. I mean, it's got all these kind of twists and turns that are going on, different family dynamics that are happening. You would just be intrigued by all that's going on. So again, if you're not hearing something today, you want to go back and look. I would encourage you to go back and look at some of this story. But Abraham was married to Sarah. And Abraham and Sarah had been promised by God that they would have a child at some point. Now, Sarah kept getting older and older and older and older. And the older she got, she thought, well, I'm not going to have a child. And then at one point, she tried to take things in her own hands, which really messed up some family dynamics as well. We're not going to get into it. But again, it's a great soap opera if you want to get into it. But eventually, in her old age, she found out she was pregnant. And she and Abraham had a son. And their son's name was Isaac. Now, Isaac, for some of you may not know, and I actually did not know this, even though, you know, I read the Bible and stuff, but uh, I have a son named Isaac, and Isaac means what? It means laughter, okay? And if you can imagine an older lady getting pregnant, that would have to cause some sort of laughter in your own mind, you know? You can't imagine, you know, one of my grandparents going up and saying, hey, uh, Chuck, we just want you to know I'm pregnant. Okay, you know, like, I got to babysit my uh, uncle, or uh, my, uh, yeah, uncle, or whatever, you know, and I'm going to do that, you know? So... Um, there would be sort of be that sort of um, uh, feeling going around. So it said that um, Isaac meant laughter. And then Isaac, they were trying to find a wife for Isaac. And so they sent somebody out to go find a wife for Isaac. And in finding a wife, they, uh, they prayed to God and asked God to send someone along the way. And this was sort of a prearranged marriage, basically. But Isaac married a lady by the name of Rebecca. And Isaac and Rebecca had this great relationship. And as she got pregnant, she was pregnant with twins. And the two twins were this. They were Esau and then it was Jacob. Now when Esau came out, it says this, it said he was very bloody and he was very hairy. Now I can identify with the hairy part, you know. Uh, I don't have it on my head, but you know, everybody else, yeah, pretty hairy, okay. So I can identify with that. But Esau was sort of this man's man. It said that he was a hunter. He was hairy. He was rough and rugged, you know, and, and that's sort of who Esau was. And it says that Isaac really favored his son Esau because he was the hunter. He would go out and bring in this great food for him and he would take care of a lot of things for him. And then it says, then there was Esau on the other hand, or excuse me, there was Jacob. Man, I told you I'm going to get all my names mixed up, okay? But there was Jacob on the other hand. And Jacob, it says that he would really like to more or less hang around the tents. And it says that he was more cunning. He, was, he liked the cooking a little bit more. He liked staying inside a little bit more. He didn't want to get out in all the rough and ruggedness of things. And matter of fact, it says that Rebecca actually favored Jacob more than she did Esau. Well, time had sort of passed and, and Jacob, being very cunning and very tricky, at one point convinces his brother, who was very hungry at the time, he convinces his brother Esau to give him his birthright. And what the birthright meant is that when your, when your father died, then you would be given all the privileges of being the firstborn son, which means you got a double portion of everything and you got the greater blessing. So Jacob convinced Esau to give up that birthright really for some food. Now, the time had come where Isaac was going to pass away and he was going to die. And so Isaac called the two sons to him and he was going to, he was going to give them the blessing. And Jacob, along with the help of his mother, they basically tricked Isaac into giving the blessing Esau was supposed to get to Jacob. And so Jacob got the firstborn's blessing. And then Esau came in later and got sort of a secondary blessing. And when Esau found out that he was only getting the secondary blessing, man, was he upset. Matter of fact, he was so upset, it said that he began to mumble to some of the servants and some of the people around, as soon as my dad passes away and as soon as we've mourned him, I'm going after my brother Jacob and I'm going to kill him. Well, Rebecca heard about this, the mom. And so she goes up to Jacob and she says, you better get out of here as quick as you can. I want you to go to my brother's family, Laban, and I want you to go spend some time with them. But you need to get out of here because your brother Esau is plotting to kill you. And I'll tell you what, I will send you word when you are able to come back. So 
See all this whole story and all this trickery and all this stuff? We've, we've got sort of this bigger, broader story. This is where we're going to be at today. So let's read to um, Genesis chapter 29, starting with verse 15 here. Genesis 29, 15 says this, And Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month. Laban said to him, Just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. And before I get in there, I forgot to tell you one other part of the story. So let me go back to this. Once Jacob ran away, it says that at, he had a time where he was asleep. He began to see a vision from God and God told him, I'm going to bless you and your descendants. And then it says that Jacob went to this well. And when he was at this well, he was looking for his, his uncle's family. And when he came to this well, he asked all the shepherds around there, do you know my uncle Laban? And some of them said, yes. And by the way, there is his daughter, Rachel, coming. Rachel came up to the well. It says that Jacob rolled the stone off of the well, began to feed her animals, said that we're related. Rachel went back, told her father Laban that, hey, you got your nephew here. He wants to know if he can stay with you. And he runs back and says, you know, you're more than welcome to stay. So that's why we said that after he'd been there for a month. And so in verse 16, then it says, now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to make love to her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. And Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter as her attendant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, it's not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also, in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived. And when she gave birth to his son, she said, Now at least my husband will become attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. So he named him Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to his son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. Let's pray together. Father, again, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the power that there is in it. To think that these words were written so long ago and yet still apply to us today is crazy. And it just shows your awesomeness and your wonder and the way that you were able to write things that are are overwhelming for all times. I pray today that as we would dig into your word, that it would cause us to look at our own relationships, look at our own situations, and be moved by your spirit. I pray, Lord, that today that we would hear from you and not from me. In your name we pray. Amen. So, kind of a whole crazy story. Like I said, it's a big soap proper thing going on here and situation. I can't imagine sort of what was going on to this at this time. Now, before I even get started with this, I want you to understand, we're going we're gonna to look at a couple of different things. I said we're going to be looking at relationships, and we're going to be, uh, just in general, we're going to be looking at marriage relationships as well. But the one thing that's sort of funny to me in this story is this. If you remember, Jacob is the one who tricked his brother Esau. So he was already known for being cunning and sort of tricky anyways. Now, it's funny because the one who was was tricking people has now been tricked. And instead of giving Rachel to be his wife, he's given Leah to be his wife. Now, in verse 17, as we go through this story, because this is the part I want to focus on, I want to look a little bit today at Leah. Because I think most of us will read this story and say, man, what a great love story. The love story that here's Jacob, he works for 14 years to be united with Rachel. 
And isn't that great? And it is. What a sort of moving thing. But the fact is, there's still another lady involved in the whole situation, Leah. In verse 17, we read that Leah is what? She's referred to as weak eyes. As weak eyes. Now, that's really just a nice way of saying that she wasn't very good looking. Okay? It's like sometimes when you're... Um, have you ever been around kids that are messing around and they're doing foolish things and it doesn't seem like they're ever going to get it? You'll see an older person sometimes go, oh, bless it, bless it, you know? And what they mean is I don't think that, ever, that kid's ever going to get it, so only the Lord can help them, you know? And so it's sort of just a nice way of saying that. And what we notice with Leah is that Leah, for all intents and purposes, we recognize that she, she wasn't beautiful. Um, she probably always lived underneath the shadow of Rachel, who was considered more beautiful and more pleasing to look at. And then here was Leah. Matter of fact, you can even really just from the suggestion of the story figure, she was probably so bad looking that it says that her dad actually had to trick somebody into marrying her. You know, it's like he decided that this was the only way that he was ever going to get his daughter married off. Now, can you imagine being Leah then in this situation? What would you feel like? You'd feel broken. You'd feel that nobody ever wants you. You'd feel like you're never, ever going to be good enough for anybody. You're always rejected. You're never looked on at first. No one ever delights in your coming. And even your own father had to trick somebody into marrying you. And I can't imagine what that dejected feeling would have been like at that time. Matter of fact, it came to sort of a crazy point in the climax of the story and when in verse 25 we read this we read that you know Jacob he, he marries who he thinks is Rachel but maybe because of drinking at the feast or maybe because of the way they had the veils it says that he didn't know he was sleeping with Leah that night he wakes up in the morning and sees Leah and what does he do? Does he says, hey honey how you doing? No, he runs out of the tent goes to get slave and says what have you done to me? Now again can you imagine feeling dejected in that situation right there? You're on your honeymoon, you're with the one that you think you're going to be with the rest of your life, and he gets up and says, I didn't want any part of this. This is not what I agreed to. This is what, not what I signed up for. This is not what I worked for at all. Can you imagine how you would have been feeling in that situation? For all intents and purposes, I believe what happened is she was in a dead-end relationship. And I want to ask you, are you in a dead-end relationship? Have you had that moment when... And this can go for married people, but you have that moment when you thought you married the perfect spouse and, and they were great looking and they did all these things for you. And then for somehow, maybe this was the next day, maybe it was 10 years later, but you have that moment when you wake up and you think, whoa, what did I do? This isn't the person that I married. Maybe you look at that other person and you decide, boy, they're a little bit more high maintenance than I thought. Maybe you look at that person and say, they're really a little bit more depressive than I thought you know what I think they put on a lot more weight than I thought they were going to and and all of a sudden you begin to find all these flaws and all these failures within this person you says this isn't who I had intended to marry and you feel like you're in a dead-end relationship maybe the two of you aren't going the same direction you once did you no longer agree on anything you just sort of are passing people in the night and you just don't spend time getting to connect with one another maybe that's where you feel like your relationship is that with your spouse. And for some of you, it's not just about marriage relationships because we know that there are other relationships that we have been involved in that can sort of seem dead end at times. Even those of us who go to work, maybe we go to work every once in a while and we feel like this job is just going nowhere and, and I don't know what to do anymore and you just feel like you're in a dead end job situation. Or maybe there's family members or kids that you used to pour into but for some reason you no longer have their ear and, and you keep wanting to pour into them but they don't really give you the time of day anymore and you just feel like you're in a dead-end relationship. Maybe there's friends of yours that, that you want to connect with but for, for whatever reason your situation has sort of changed. I remember going through these experiences in sort of each phase in life. Like there was a bunch of us single guys that would always hang out and then once uh, we started getting married it was like they could no longer hang out and do the single things that we once did. They sort of had to be with their spouse more and more and more. And all of a sudden, you felt like those dead-end relationships were no longer going to work for you. Or maybe for some of you, you've been with a group of married couples and you've been able to do a lot of things together as couples, but then all of a sudden, you become pregnant and all of a sudden, you realize that your time is spent with your child 
and you can no longer hang out with the other married couples the way you once did because you have to worry about a babysitter and you have to worry about expenses that are occurring and, and accruing and all that stuff. And so you can no longer be in those relationships. And so you feel like you're in those dead-end relationships. I don't know about you, but ask the question, are you in a dead-end relationship? Leah was in a dead-end relationship. And what was interesting about Leah, and I think it's a problem that all of us have because God made us to want to be in relationship with one another. He didn't make us to be sort of these hermits and all by ourselves. He made us to communicate and connect with one another. So Leah did what? She wanted to connect with her husband. Matter of fact, this dead-end relationship led to her having a desire to seek the love and the support of her husband. And she would have done anything she could at this time. She was probably thinking, how can I make him love me? How can I be more attracted to him than my sister? How can I just get a little bit of time of day with him? What would that feel like? What would that look like? Her desire was to love her husband. And then she would hope in turn that would be reciprocated. Matter of fact, it says that the Lord looked at Leah's life and said, you know what? I will give Leah children. And Leah, every time she got pregnant, her hope was this. Wow, I'm pregnant. I'm going to have a son. Now my husband will love me because I'm producing a son, something that Rachel cannot do for him. Surely he will love me. She had the first child, nothing. She has the second child again. And, and again, she thinks, oh my, I'm having two sons for him. This is so much better than, and Rachel still cannot have any children. Surely my husband will love me now. And again, nothing. We read a third and a fourth time she is pregnant and God has blessed her with children. Rachel still has have none. And she even says at one point, he has to love me now. And again, that love is not reciprocated in any way. There's nothing wrong with desire, is there? We all have that desire to be in relationships with one another. Maybe for some of you, you have a desire to, to, to work your hardest, hoping that your boss will see how, how much you've done and he will acknowledge what you've done. Maybe some of you are hoping that if you invite this person over, maybe they will reciprocate one day and invite you over to their place or invite you to a meal. Maybe you're hoping that if I hang out with the right groups and I get in with the right cliques, then maybe that will fulfill me in some way. Maybe some of you in your relationships think, if I just do more for my spouse, then they will notice me and then they will love me more like I really need to be loved. And you have this desire to seek that relationship and that love, but it seems like nothing ever comes your way. And then what happens is that desire may lead you to disappointment. That desire may lead you to disappointment. We read that each and every time that Leah became pregnant and she had that desire, again, nothing ever happened. And she was in that mode of disappointment. You see, we can seek desire so much that it begins to become a distraction for us. We begin to become disillusioned and disenfranchised and you begin to take it out on everyone else. Verses 31 through 35 says that Leah longed for her husband, but her husband longed for someone else. Instead of being upset with the desire of her affection, she began to be upset with who? Her sister. Her sister. You see, desire can lead to disappointment. She was hoping that having these kids over and over again would set her up to be the place that she wants. And you and I can identify again because you know that there are times when, again, we have worked so hard and, and we're hoping that our boss recognizes it and then all of a sudden he gives the promotion to someone else or gives someone else the credit. And in that moment we experience what? Disappointment. You know that we invite people out to hang out with us and we invited them over for a meal and we get the best of what we can and give them the best of what we can and we're hoping in turn that they'll invite us over only to learn later that they invited somebody else over and you feel what? Disappointment. You ask somebody to hang out with you at a movie or to go to an event with you and five minutes before the event's supposed to happen they call up and says, I can't make it after all. And then you find out later that they went with somebody else and you feel what? disappointment. 
You do all you can to make your spouse love you. You, you do the dishes or you do the laundry or you, you make yourself up and, and you buy the right things and you try to say the right things and you're hoping that they will reciprocate in some way and that would say, oh man, you're the greatest person and I love you so much and I want to be with you forever. And they say nothing. They don't even acknowledge that you did anything. And in that moment you feel disappointment. You see, desire can lead to disappointment. And we can get stuck in that mode. But I wonder, how will you respond when disappointment comes? Because disappointment leads to decisions. Disappointment leads to decisions. And in those moments of decisions, listen, you can either be content or you can be vindictive in some way. I sort of like the approach that Leah at first takes because with each child that she's given, it says that she begins to praise God. The problem is she just can't rest in that moment. What she finds herself doing is she finds herself getting sort of wrapped up in the whole idea that still my husband doesn't love me and and I'm feeling rejected and dejected and I don't know how I'm going to make it past this. And her love, instead of being on her children, focus being on her children in that moment, she continues to focus in on her own needs and says, I'm not being loved, I'm not being cared for, and I am disappointed in the situation. And it causes problems within the whole relationship, doesn't it? Because even later, look what happens to Rachel. Rachel, who was loved by God, eventually does what? She says that I need a child. Right? As a matter of fact, she can't have any children. What does she do? She takes her servant and gives it to Jacob and says, sleep with my servant and then you'll have that child and then that child will be known as mine. And that's exactly what happens. And she thinks that this will fulfill her in some way. And so all of a sudden you have this thing where each of them is trying to have more children than the other, hoping that they will get the love and respect of their husband. Matter of fact, when Rachel was trying to get pregnant, she goes up to Jacob and she says, Jacob, give me a child. He says, what am I supposed to do? This is only for God to take care of. And in those moments, it was funny, the one who has been loved by Jacob all the time no longer feels love and fulfillment in Jacob because she needs a child in order to see her fulfillment. We later read in the story in chapter 30 there that one of Leah's sons is, is, is collecting these mandrake plants. And Rachel wants one and asks if she can have them. And, and listen to what happens. Because Leah is so upset and so frustrated with the situation that she can't give her husband to to love her. Like, watch the way that she does. She almost sort of gets vindictive. She gets upset. And she says, why should I give you anything for my son? You already have our husband's love. I don't get any of that. And can you blame her? I mean, she's reacting and responding the way most of us would. And when we don't get our way, we sort of we sort of figure out ways to be vindictive, don't we? I don't, I don't get the promotion or I don't get the recognition at work, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to find that person that got that recognition and I'm going to find every little mistake they make and I'm going to start letting people know all the mistakes they make so that they will be found out. We get where we can't have some of the friendships that we want. We can't have some of the relationships and the, and the people that we were pouring into when we were inviting over and they don't invite us over and all of a sudden we start to pick at those other friends that they have. And we start to tear them down. And we get vindictive with other people that had no involvement in the whole situation at all, did they? Don't we find ourselves even in dead-end relationships when we're in a marriage relationship? Don't we find ourselves being upset with our spouse and, and because they didn't notice us, they didn't love us enough, and so what do we do? Do we take it out on our spouse? No, because they might say something back. Lee didn't do what? Lee didn't go to Jacob and say, I'm really frustrated with you. Why? Because you weren't allowed to do that to the men at the time. She didn't go back to her dad Laban and said, Dad, why would you trick someone into marrying me? It put me in this awful situation. Those are the people that she should have been frustrated with. Instead, she's taking it out on who? Rachel, who really had nothing to do with the whole situation. And now these once sisters that loved each other are now fighting with one another. And all of a sudden, sort of the decisions that they have made and decisions that have been made for them causing destruction in their family. If I don't get along with my spouse, I can't say something to her. Why? Because she'll say something back to me. So who do I take it out on sometimes? My kids. That's who gets the brunt of it. 
And then all of a sudden they can't figure out why I'm so upset with them and they have every reason to feel that way because I'm really not upset with them. I'm really upset with my spouse. And so we find ourselves sort of getting into that mode of action. Leah was frustrated. I wish she could have gone to the point where she did this. Because at one point in the story, you see, she's praising God. Thank you, God, for giving me this children. What if she would have been content in the moment and focused in on that relationship? How much further could she have been along? You see, what I want us to know is this. Is that in our relationships, there are times when we just have to sort of sell on or press on in situations. Now, I want to speak in the relationships in two totally different ways. Because I did a Google search of um, dead-end relationships. I went through 10 pages. And there was not one positive thing that it said. Matter of fact, one said, here's to help in a dead-end relationship. And you know what it said? Get out. (laughs) Get out. Each and everything said to get out. And here's what I know. I don't need Google to give me the answers, do I? I need the Word of God. And the Word of God simply tells us, and this is, and this is just in general for marriage relationships, listen. The Word of God tells us that when you need to get a divorce is when there's marital unfaithfulness. And marital unfaithfulness is not just because somebody didn't pick up their stuff one day, and that's what they agreed to do. Marital unfaithfulness is talking about adultery. And I do know several couples that have been through adultery and have made it through, and, and that's great. But it's sort of one of the outs that he gives us. And the other out that scholars would really agree with and concur with is this, is if you're being physically beaten or abused, it would be another reason to get out. But what we have a tendency to do is we have a tendency to want to get out in the simplest and easy ways all the time. And that's not what God asks of us. He says to just press on, just focus on the things that are important and real. And sometimes those things that we may have to put our focus is is on our kids. Here's what I love about this story. And it may be something that you didn't pick up on at first. But did you know this rejected, dejected, this ugly woman that no one else really wanted? That had to be tricked into being married. This person that everyone else took for granted didn't want to be around. She was demeaned in every way. You know what happens later? This person that was demeaned became redeemed in Christ Jesus. You know why? Look at verse 35. What child was born then? Judah. And if you go through the lineage of Judah, and we read about the Lion of Judah, Jesus comes out of that situation. Jesus comes out of the brokenness of a relationship. Jesus comes out of a dead-end relationship, a relationship that didn't seem to be going anywhere. That's where Jesus Christ came out of. Jesus took a woman that no one wanted to be around, no one wanted to love, everyone sort of had disregarded, and he was trying to bless her in some unique ways, and out of that came Jesus Christ. And not only that, but listen to this. Those of us who are feeling dejected, those of us who are feeling rejected, we feel ugly in some way, we feel like we can't accomplish much in life, and we feel very broken in life. Guess what? We can be demeaned in every single way, but we're redeemed through Christ Jesus, just like Leah was. That is something I can hold on to. That is where true and real relationship comes from. You see, if you and I can get to the point where we focus on what is really important, listen, I may be in some dead-end relationships. I may be in some relationships that are going nowhere. I can be redeemed in Christ Jesus. He wants my love and he wants my attention. In Exodus 20, we read this. As he's given us the Ten Commandments, he says, I am a jealous God. In other words, he wants our love. And then the first commandment is to what? Love the Lord your God. Because that's the relationship that should matter. That's the one that will never disappoint you. That's the one that our desire should be for. It doesn't mean that we're going to have perfect lives. Because he said in this life you will have trouble. What it means is he will never let us down. He will be there by our side each and every step of the way. He has come to redeem us who are broken and dejected and rejected. And I say praise God for that moment. 
And I want you to know this today. If there are any of you right now that feel like relationships are not going your way, you feel like your life is just a mess, you've been through some pretty bad situations and you feel very broken in life, listen, Christ Jesus is for you. He's come to redeem you. He's come to have the relationship with you. You value your relationship, then value Jesus Christ. And some of you that might be going in marriage relationships where you feel like they are just dead end. Like there's just no movement at all. I want to ask you in those moments to be content. I want to ask you in those moments that you're trying to sell on, that you hoist up the mask and you put up the sail and you let the word of God just breathe into your life. And that you could be content in those moments. And that boat and that ship and that relationship may not take you where you want to go. But I would just ask you to look out and enjoy the scenery along the way. God is trying to redeem you. Some of you in broken relationships, listen, you may have kids in those relationships. Look to them. But I do know this. The God who is faithful and just will help us through each and every phase and step of life. The scripture tells us those who mourn will be comforted. In other words, he will be there by our side. I would love to give you hope and promise and say that your relationship is going to just be great from this point on. But the truth is two people have to make a decision in order to make the relationship go. But I would love to add a third one in that and say, by the help of God, get there to the place you need to go. 